This, this is the DiPietro, Canty, and Rothenberg podcast. I'm a big star, you know. Listen live weekday mornings from 5 to 8 a.m. on 98.7 ESPN in New York. The ESPN app, the TuneIn app, or on your smart speaker. Hey, Alexa, play ESPN New York 98.7. DCR. Got the number one pick and a Super Bowl champ with the man they can't seem to stump. Do something dumb, that's an observation. CLT make him need to run. That's Lawrence Taylor! Call trash, DMT for short. One day if we best, won't you peep the score? Sports Center E gonna be top stories of the morning. While you're yawning, grab your coffee, rise and shine with 98.7. This is drive time. We provide highlights from your favorite teams. Dave, Chris, and Rick making plenty of picks. It's Rule 76. And off and running on this Tuesday, it is August 3rd. It is once again time for DPHO, Canty, and Rothenberg. And once again, I am not any of those three people. Gordon <laughs> Damer in for the R&R boys. The R&R boys, obviously, Rothenberg and Rick, they continue to rest up and relax while you-know-who continues to show up and do the work. That, of course, would be the one, the only, Chris Canty. Chris, Good morning. Good morning, Gordon. Uh, I'm a little bit surprised that the R and R boys are are taking this much of a break, man. I mean, you, you could say that those guys are load managing, getting ready for the football season. Oh my lord! And, and those are guys that are adamantly opposed to that. So it's a little bit surprising seeing how they're taking so much time off. Kawhi Leonard is saying, "Guys, it's time to get back to work. It's time exactly. to exactly so, that's what, obese man that's going to sit in the chair." That's what I'm saying. Yeah, uh, I hear you. Well, look, I'm, I'm sure if you use your vacation time like they use their vacation time, we will not see you in November and December. I mean, you must have a lot of it stored up someplace because those two guys, they, yeah. they use it. Yeah. They swing it around. They, let's they put it, let's it. Put no it out doubt. there. Yeah, no, no doubt. I, no doubt. But around here, what do they say? If you, if you don't use it, you lose it. So those guys are taking full advantage. I don't blame them. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't got, blame them. We got a ton to run down today, right? The Yankees uh, last night. I mean, that loss for them was so on brand to go out after a good weekend. Everybody's starting to feel pointed in the right direction. We had, the, I think it was the last caller of the day yesterday asking us about, uh, are you back on the Yankees bandwagon? Have they turned it back around? only to go out and lose to the Orioles the way they did. I mean, that was so 2021 Yankees. We'll get to that. We'll get to the Mets. Who- Gordon, Gordon, the cat gave the Orioles more trouble than the Yankees. Oh, line my Lord. It was like the grounds <laughs> crew had never seen a cat before. Like, they didn't know that, that, that oh, it's not going to fly away. We actually have to go out there and do something. If they didn't open that door, that cat would still be running and the grounds crew would still be chasing it. Let's the cat it was like Barry Sanders out there, Gordon. That, I mean, he was just breaking ankles all over the place. I, I yeah. still can't figure out why it took them so long <laughs> to to figure out a way to get the cat off the field. Just it was it was hilarious to me. Yeah, I mean, Michael brought it up on the broadcast. Is somebody going to go get it? I mean, it was just sitting there for like a good two, three minutes before anybody said, you know what, we're going to have to go get this thing. So we'll get to that. We'll get to the Mets bad weekend, which uh, continued on Monday. But let's start with the Knicks because they did not waste any time yesterday. NBA free agency, the NBA offseason off and running. And partly I want to leave with the Knicks because of what they did, but partly it's it, I just can't take the Yankees anymore. So Knicks go out. <laughs> they, they basically said, you know what? We're rolling it back to a certain degree. They bring back Derrick Rose, which was about as predictable as any move will be this offseason. They bring back Nerland's Noel for Rose, three for 43. Noel, three for 32. Alec Burks is back, three for 30. And then I guess the big move, they go out and they sign Evan Fortier to a contract four years, $78 million, clearly focused on kind of keeping their core together, replacing Fournier, uh, replacing Bullock with Fournier. So what were your initial impressions of the Knicks day one of free agency? Well, Gordon, it felt a lot like musical chairs, and the Knicks didn't want to be left without a, a spot when the music stopped. And you saw some of the other potential point guard targets that the Knicks we're, we're looking at kind of come off the board and it just felt like this was this was the the path that made the most sense like let's b- bring back Derrick Rose who played really well I think he finished second in six man of the year voting so let's go ahead and bring him back let's go ahead and re-sign Nerlens Noel who filled in great for Mitchell Robinson somebody that was injury prone Noel is a guy that you've proven 
that you can rely on, and then go ahead and, and re-sign Alec Burks, who was great off the bench, and he was able to provide some some point guard relief with that second unit. That's that's something that you also you know might need if you're not able to pull off another move this offseason for a trade for a point guard. So it's just the moves that they made made sense, and then upgrading to Evan Fournier, having him take over where Reggie Bullock left off. Like I just I just feel like that that made a lot of sense as well. So I, I like the direction that they're they're going in, but it just it just didn't feel like there was that opportunity out there for that big swing, at least early on in the offseason. Um, so we'll, we'll just have to kind of monitor it, see what happens. Um, but, you know, th- this is this is what the best way for them to use their cap space as far as Leon Rose views it. And I have a hard time disagreeing with it because, again, it was a team that a lot of people fell in love with last year just with the way that they played. Yeah, and look, none of the moves I would say were surprising because you did want to, I mean, I said Derek Rose being back, you know, to, to get him and to pair him up with Tom Thibodeau, you knew no matter what, Derek Rose was almost certainly going to be back with this Knicks team, so that doesn't surprise yeah. you. The other moves don't surprise me, but I, I, I have to admit there is a little bit of a back and forth that I, I went through looking at each of the moves. Not that I don't like any of the moves per se, but it's not like you're getting any bargains, right? Like part of the reason why these guys, they did absolutely overperform what their contracts were last year. And each of them getting, I think it's each of them got three-year deals. So it's not like you're, you're spending or, or breaking the bank per se. But I thought that this offseason was about upgrading the talent, right? Like it's not just about bringing back the same crew. And I think one of the criticisms... Uh, of the Tom Thibodeau hire was that you would be a little worried because of his reliance on veterans so much that you would lock yourself into a lot of his type of guys and it would kind of cap your ceiling. Now, look, the Knicks aren't done. I'm sure they're going to do other things. Evan Fournier is an upgrade, I think, over Reggie Bullock in terms of what the Knicks need. But it did not exactly blow me away. And I can see there being some criticism of just kind of rolling it back with the same group as they had last year. Well, I mean, Gordon, you got to have somebody that wants to take your money, and you got to have uh, you know willing participants if if you're going to go out there and make a big splash via trade. And it just didn't seem like at the time any of those options were available for Leon Rose. So I think this was the next best thing. I mean, ideally, you want to upgrade the talent talent level on your team. But uh, I mean, if there's not a move to be made, then this is. This is your fallback, which is trying to bring back the core of your team last year, which was a group that was good enough to be able to be the fourth seed in the Eastern Conference and host a home playoff series in the first round. So I, 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 I get what you're saying. Like none of the moves are like offensive when you look at the, the years or the money that they doled out. But at the same time, it does leave a little bit left to be desired just because. You know, you felt like this is a team that you want to see take that next step, and you know that they can't unless you add some more dynamic playmakers to this squad, especially in the backcourt. Yeah, I mean, they can, they clearly cannot be done here. But I mean, if I'm uh, if I'm putting on my positive Knicks hat, obviously you wanted to bring back uh, a lot of the the core guys that you relied on last year. You're uh, it's an upgrade to me going from Bullock. He's not going to be in the starting lineup like he was last year. It's going to be Evan Fournier, who I think is an upgrade offensively. Alfred Payton's not going to be back. But the Knicks, as long as they realize, and I think they do, they still need to go out and get a point guard. Mm -hmm. If they're going to rely on Derrick Rose, which I didn't think they wanted to do last year, eventually they were forced to because of Payton's struggles, they can't be relying on him in the starting lineup. They have to know that, right? No, I don't think they can rely on Derrick Rose in the starting lineup, but I guess it's a situation where they got to bring in another point guard to be able to share in those minutes because Derrick Rose, ideally you want him playing anywhere from, you know, 20, 25 minutes a night, and then you've got somebody else that can kind of share in the workload. I, I don't I don't know that that's, that's one of those things that they just didn't see the guy that they wanted or they're waiting for the price of the guy that they're looking for to come down a little bit, but I mean – you know, you saw how aggressive teams around the NBA yesterday were in terms of trying to make moves and lock guys up. Like this is going to be fast and furious, and you just hope that the Knicks don't 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 get left out when it comes to finding somebody that's going to be able to share that workload with Derrick Rose. Because the last thing you want to happen, Gordon, is to try to play Derrick Rose thirty thirty five minutes a no, night, and the guy breaks that. down in the middle of the season. Like right. that that's the last thing you want they because all of a sudden that. you stifle the development of all the other young players that you have on this team, namely R.J. Barrett. That's the one that, that, that you look at the most and you're saying he needs a point guard 
to help him to continue to ascend as a player. And although Derrick Rose is, is great, you realize Derrick Rose is going to be limited because he can't he can't be that guy night in, night out, playing 35 minutes a game. It just, it's not going to happen. So they, they have to have some urgency about finding a point guard. But here's the thing. I don't think it's not because they're looking. I just feel like some of the guys that they had targeted early decided they were going to do other things. Like Lonzo Ball signed with the Chicago Bulls as a restricted free agent. Chris Paul re-signed with the Phoenix Suns. Kyle Lowry got traded to the Miami Heat. So it's just like those are the guys that the Knicks were in, you know, you know, were potentially targeting, you know, throughout the off season, and it just felt like no, those things weren't going to materialize for them. So now they had to move on to their plan B, which is making sure that they brought back a core guys that they could trust. Now we'll see what they can do in the trade market. Yeah, and, and and I do think that they kind of struck the right balance in keeping what they had together and not not taking a step back. Uh, but also not locking themselves in to something that's going to to take away from their flexibility, right? Like we mm-hmm. all realize that at some point the Knicks are going to have to find that transcendent superstar that they're going to be able to trade for or bring in some way. Uh, and it wasn't going to be through free agency this year, but they didn't lock themselves into any contract with, now that's going to remove that Uh, flexibility long term let's hear from Bobby Marks who uh, gives us some thoughts about uh, the Knicks approach to free agency this year New York went the continuity way and you know besides Evan Fournier who they sign you you bring back Nerlens Noel and you bring back Alec Burke certainly um, you know Derek Rose here and that's kind of how they're going to you know enter the uh, the season and I think what New York would have did it does is now you have a, a bunch of controllable contracts out there when if the time comes that you, if there's a deal to be made for one of these disgruntled all-stars as i always say then you have these team-friendly type contracts that you know you could potentially move down the road yeah so kind of keeping that flexibility while also mm-hmm. kind of rewarding and locking into at least all right we know this group we know these guys and we know how the fit like i saw one article about you know how do the the, the Knicks moves fit with this team well you kind of know because yeah. <laughs> outside of evan fournier who should be an upgrade in terms of outside shooting uh these are guys that you relied on down the stretch last year you know they're guys that you relied on and they're guys that produced i mean they they exceeded everybody's expectations last year but the question that we all have moving forward now is what happens with this team with the eastern conference that that we that we're seeing right now like when the brooklyn nets come back healthy those mm-hmm. big 3 and then the philadelphia sixers whatever they do this offseason they're still going to be around there anchored by joel mb the milwaukee bucks that just won the chip the atlanta hawks that made it to the conference finals Miami, now that they've added Kyle Lowry and retained Goran Dragic. Like, you know, Boston with Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum back and healthy together again and not having to deal with the, the impact of, of COVID on their season potentially. So I, I just, it, Indiana with Rick Carlisle as their head coach. Like, I mean, all of these teams are going to be improved. Where do the Knicks fit in that pecking order? And, you know, that's, that's the biggest question. I mean, talent wise, you know, it's hard to make a case to say that the Knicks are any are more talented than any one of those teams that I just rattled off. No, they're and, not. I mean, so I mean, that, <laughs> you're talking no. about them. You're talking about them being on down there. You know, you know, potentially a seventh or eighth seed in the Eastern Conference, and it's not that they would fall off. It's just that everybody around them is improving. So that's why, you know, a lot of Knicks fans feel like this was an off season where you wanted to try to be aggressive and add to. Uh, what you what you already have in that locker room and build on the success that you had in year one with Leon Rose and Tibbs. Yeah, and, and it, I think your your level of happiness or disappointment comes from what your expectations were or are going into this off season. Mm-hmm. I, I think that the blueprint that the Nets put forward a couple of years ago. I don't think that's really a repeatable blueprint for other teams. I know Nick fans kind of feel that way. Like, hey, we had our respectable season when we made the playoffs and we showed that we should be a destination point for free agents and this type of stuff. But it's pretty clear at this point that the Knicks are going to have to kind of go through the, like a little bit more of a slow building process rather than, hey, we had one good season and now free agents are going to target us as the place to be. It's about, I think now with this group, kind of building it up slowly and, and keeping your options open for when that superstar does become available, but just kind of thinking that you'll throw it out there, 41 wins, the fourth seed in the East, and then all of a sudden people are going to be flocking to the Garden. That clearly was not, is, is not what's going to happen. And whether or not the Knicks have actually improved all that much, I think it's an improvement, 
but I don't know whether or not it's it's all that much. I don't think that they did that much yesterday to close the gap between those teams that you mentioned. No, they didn't. But but here's the thing, and I, and I understand where Knicks fans are coming from, looking across town and seeing what the Brooklyn Nets did, but the Brooklyn Nets situation just timed up perfectly with the free agent class of – um, 2019, like that, that it just felt like, like okay, we we just made the playoffs. We showed that we're a functional group. We turned D'Angelo Russell into an all star, and now all of a sudden, this feels like a place where you know Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant can come and build whatever it is that they want to build. Like it just it it all set itself up perfectly. You don't have that type of scenario this off season. Like there 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 aren't those guys out there that you would say are transformative players that are free agents. You know what I mean, and 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 the ones that are, were, you know, they expected to resign with the current teams that they're at. So it was one of those situations where you you weren't going to be able to lure, you know, a couple of max contract guys over. It just wasn't going to happen. Now, the the good thing is that you do have a core of players that that were able to get you to the playoffs, and that will be the expectation going into the next season. You know, it's just this this is a playoff caliber team. And so for Knicks fans, I mean, uh, there's got to be a part of you that's just happy that your team is playing competitive basketball and it feels like the success that they had this past year is going to be sustainable, albeit it might not be at the same seed in the Eastern Conference. It still feels like this Knicks team is going to be a playoff team. So, I mean, you have to take that given what, what has been the last decade and a half of Knicks basketball, which has been abysmal. So, I mean, I just – it feels like the organization is functional – they're on solid footing, and so I don't think Knicks fans should panic just because their team didn't go out there and make a splashy move at the start of free agency. Thanks for listening to the DiPietro, Canty, and Rothenberg podcast. You're absolutely right. Catch the show on demand wherever and whenever you want. Just subscribe to us, rate us, and review us wherever you get your podcasts. If there was ever a time for anybody to make a move in the National League East, and I don't know what it is, but it does kind of feel like this would be the time. Like, if anybody wants to come up here and uh, maybe make a challenge for the division, Phillies, Braves, Braves, this would be the time. The Phillies, their high water mark of the season. It was four games over 500. That was after the fourth game of the season. So it's not like they're exactly setting the world on fire. Uh, and the Braves obviously have not been even at 500 the entire season, but we've touched on that. Let's touch a little bit on uh, the Brooklyn Nets. We, we looked at the Knicks moves, which uh, obviously are going to be a major focus as, as free agency rolls on and the offseason rolls on. But uh, the Nets... We talk about the Knicks rolling things back, and uh, this portion of DCR is brought to you by Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Uh, The Nets decide, obviously, bring Blake Griffin back, a one-year deal. And if there's ever a team that was going to say, you know what, we're going to roll it back from last year with primarily the same group, uh, the Brooklyn Nets would seem to be that team, Chris. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what they are. I mean, it's going to be about the big three and just trying to fill in the roster spots around them. Now, with those salaries, they don't have a lot of flexibility in terms of shaping their roster and adding supporting cash. I mean, Spencer Dinwiddie's you know, signing or on the verge of signing a deal with the Wizards. Jeff Green left to go to the Denver Nuggets. Um, so, I mean, those, those, are, those are guys that, you know, you're going to have to find a way to be able to kind of add to this roster to kind of offset those losses. Um, and, and create some more depth. So, I mean, we'll, we'll see what they ended up, end up doing. I, I mean, they, they, they're, uh, they've got some interest in Bryn Forbes and Patty Mills. We'll end up, we'll see what happens with those guys. But I mean, the Brooklyn Nets, it's about the big three being healthy. And then you'll, you'll find enough guys that'll be able to want to come play alongside them and chase after a ring. But it's just a matter of seeing what those moves end up being. They also moved on from Landry Shamit. They traded him on draft day. So, I mean, that's another guy that played minutes for him last year that they got to figure out what they're going to do in terms of being able to bring in somebody else that could that could stretch the floor and be a shooting out, uh, a, a, a three-point threat. So, um, yeah, I mean, the Brooklyn Nets are going to be one of those teams that's in the conversation for being one of the favorites to win the NBA title as we move into this upcoming season. Um, but a lot of their prospects just depends on the health of Kyrie Irving, James Harden, and Kevin Durant. Yeah, and Patty Mills would make a lot of sense because uh, they lose Jeff Green, as you said. Mills obviously has the relationship with Sean Marks from the San Antonio days. I was kind of surprised Green was not able to land. Uh, you know, it's one of those things. Two years, ten million for Jeff Green, and then there are not a lot of bargains early on in free agency. I feel like two years, ten million for Jeff Green is kind of a bargain. 
No, it does, especially the way that Jeff Green played at certain stretches. I mean, the guy, the, the guy stepped up. He knocked down big shots. He did all the dirty work. And when that lineup went small, he was able to bang down there inside and, and kind of give them that presence um, where they, you know, they weren't going to be exploited um, in the painted area. So it's just, I, I like Jeff Green. I thought he brought that underlying grit, that toughness that you need with every team that competes at the highest level of the sport. Um, but I mean, I guess they just. It just didn't fit with what Brooklyn was trying to do. Clearly, they felt like they needed to go in a different direction. They let them walk out of the door. Yeah. Uh, where do the Nets sit now? You know, we, we take a look at uh, Lowry going to Miami. Obviously, the Bucks are, are the NBA champs. I think that you're still looking at the Nets. As long as they can have a little bit more of a normal year in terms of health, especially with James Harden, because it was unusual for him to be as hurt. Kyrie, not so much. He's, he's not, he's not most, uh, the most dependable guy in terms of injury. He, he's hurt a lot. He's, yeah. he's hurt in college. He's been hurt in the pros. He's missed NBA Finals games. I mean, it's not unusual for him to, not, uh, to, to miss some time due to injury. But where do you think the Nets sit here as we kind of look at the landscape of the league? It feels like they're in a pretty good spot, and as long as they have a little bit more of a more normal year in terms of health, they are uh, going to be the team to beat in the East again. Yeah, but can we assign that to them, though, Gordon? Like, like that's the thing that I, I, I question. Like, it's almost like how can you have any confidence in them staying healthy when you didn't see it at any point last year? I mean, even in the playoffs, we kept saying, well, as long as they get to the playoffs and the big three are healthy, then they're, they're going to be the team coming out of the East. They couldn't stay healthy in the playoffs. Yeah. I mean, well, James I mean, Harden think, with the hamstring, Kyrie Irving yeah. with, with stepping on Giannis's foot and, and twisting his ankle. Like, they couldn't stay, they couldn't stay healthy – throughout the course of the entire year. And then Kyrie Irving had that absence from the team for personal reasons. So it's just like, I, I don't, you know, coming into this this season, like I, I have to say that the Milwaukee Bucks are the favorite in the Eastern Conference. And it's not because I think when both teams are healthy, Milwaukee's better. It's just that I think that Milwaukee has a tendency to stay healthier than the Brooklyn Nets. Yeah, I can understand that, and especially as I said with Kyrie. Yeah, he he's a he's a question because of the injury history is just so extensive. But but James Harden is not generally hurt. I do think that that was kind of a fluky thing this year, and maybe part of the fact that he came into camp out of shape, and it was maybe a little bit of a weird year getting moved from Houston to the Nets, and he was just it was clear he was trying to force his way back, and he was just nowhere close to being a hundred percent. But I would think with a with a more routine offseason, getting his hamstring healthy, he's not really, to me, an injury question. And even though Durant missed as much time as he did during the regular season, I think a lot of that is because they realize that their goal is not about the regular season. Like, mm-hmm. they wouldn't care if they were the fifth seed or the fourth seed or the second seed or the third seed. It's about when they get into a playoff series, being healthy and being ready to go. So I know that he's missed a lot of time, missed the entire first season with the Nets, yep. uh, coming back from the Achilles, and did miss more than half the season during the regular season. But I do think that if you get... Uh, I, I think that there can be a level of expectation that next year, even if he does miss time in the regular season, that when the playoffs come along, Kevin Durant will be ready to go. And, and if he can get a little help, maybe not be quite so out of gas as it seemed like he was in that Buck series. No, I mean, yeah, I, 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 think, you're, I think you're right. Uh, and I would probably say that, yeah, I, I, if they can put the right supporting cast around the big three, if they can add the right role players to this roster to make things a little bit easier for those guys throughout the course of the regular season, then I think, yeah, this team, this team can absolutely get the job done. I, I just go and I go back to the, the, the health concerns just because I mean, you know, two of the big three are on the other side yep. of 30 and guys yep. no, don't typically fair. stay healthier as they get older and as they move out of the primes of their careers. So, I mean, I, I just, I look at James Harden and you look at his usage rate. I look at Kevin Durant and look at, you know, how, 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 you know, they use him. It's just, it's one of those things that, that becomes a little bit concerning. It's just like, can these guys stay healthy and manage the workload that Steve Nash is asking them to manage? I, I think that's a fair question. And I guess based on what we saw last year is why, uh, again, I got to come back to, you know, the Milwaukee Bucks being the favorites out of the Eastern Conference again this year just because, you know, their stars stay, stay healthy. Like Chris Middleton, Giannis, Drew Holiday, those, those guys don't miss games. They stay healthy. So, I mean, we'll see what ends up happening. But, um, 
But yeah, I, I think it'll be interesting to see how the Brooklyn Nets fill out the rest of their roster as we move through the NBA offseason because clearly there's some work to do um, and just seeing what pieces – you know, would fit, what guys would be interested to come and play alongside the big three and try to go after a ring. I think that's, an, that's a little bit of, that's a little bit of a storyline, a sneaky storyline throughout the NBA offseason. This portion of DCR brought to you by Indeed. Is hiring becoming your second job? Quit the hassle and get on Indeed. You'll find great candidates fast with instant match. Just sponsor a post and instantly receive a short list of quality candidates whose resumes on Indeed match your job description. Visit Indeed.com slash credit. Okay, so we'll do uh, cuddle, marry, and trash here in a second. But I did have one more question for you, Chris, when it comes to the Knicks. We're talking about them bringing back the, you know, basically running it back again. One guy who's clearly not going to be back. And, and you might be the most polarizing player in New York basketball right now from the fan base's point of view, and that would mm. be Frank Nielakina. Nielakina, from the moment that he was drafted, it just never really seemed to, um, to come together. He's a guy that does seem like he has some very unique talents. Offense is not one of them necessarily, but um, do you think wherever he winds up going, three years from now, Frank Nielakina will ever get to a point where he is – a relied upon rotational piece for a good team on the bench? Or is he just going to always be like this kind of frustrating player who has moments defensively and has moments where it looks like, you know, this guy's got some skills, but it just never translates on an NBA court? Well, I mean, the only reason that Frank is frustrating is because of the expectations where the Knicks drafted him. Like They, they took him with the eighth overall pick, if I'm not mistaken, yep. and that was the Donovan Mitchell draft. So, I mean, the Knicks fans could have had Donovan Mitchell, but you said they decided to go with Frank Nilakina, and that was because Phil Jackson felt like he was a better fit for the triangle, and Phil Jackson, <laughs> days later, to, would no longer be... would no longer be laughing, right? Exactly. It's ridiculous. But Phil Jackson would no longer be leading the organization. Do they have 11 championships to show you when they talk about that? So, I mean, it's just, it's just kind of one of those things. You talk about his career kind of never really getting going. It's like... It's hard for it to get going when the guy that's responsible for you being a New York Nick is no longer with the team. So, yeah, I, you know, Frank Nilakina was probably one of those guys that was overdrafted. I remember in all of the pre-draft scouting reports, Seth Greenberg said at his, at his peak, if this guy realizes his potential, he's going to be a reliable player off the bench. That's not exactly what you're looking for from a lottery pick. It's no. not. And so I, I just, you know, I know Knicks fans are, are a little disappointed in how things worked out with Frank, but I feel like that's more on the organization overdrafted him than it is about Frank's performance. Now, could he have been better? Should he have been better? Sure. But, I mean, at this point, you just have to move on. You have to cut your losses. Like, that. he's not going to be a part of your long-term future. No, that much was clear, right? For all the point guard issues the Knicks had last year with Alfred Payton, um, Frank Nielakina was never going to be that answer. All right, it is DCR. It is a Tuesday, and you know what that means. One of the staples of the show. It's time for Cuddle, Marry, or Trash. To cuddle. I'll tell you what, Rico. I can chase him down. Oh. I'll hold him down for you. <laughs> to marry. I don't want to give up the meat. Or to trash. I think I'm emotionally broken. That is the question. Uh, back on a Tuesday, Rick on vacation. He'll be back in, I don't know, October maybe. Maybe. <laughs> and until then... I am RJ, and I'm here for your CMT needs. We begin with Carson Wentz. He's out the next 5 to 12 weeks. That's a big range, 5 to 12. <laughs> that is a very wide range. That's He could miss He could miss a week or two. He could miss Three the first months. half of the season. We have no idea. Right? It's crazy. <laughs> I guess it's a, a loose, broken bone in his foot stemming back to a high school injury is, oh. is what, we've, what we've nailed down for that. But... Right now, they're looking at Jacob Eason. That's the guy that's getting the first team reps in practice. And anyone can tell, but maybe you can hear Ray Santiago groaning in the background. That's not what you want, to quote Joe Girardi. So, let's run through some options. Cuddle, marry, or trash the following as possible week one starters. Philip Rivers, who's coaching high school football. Nick Foles, who is a backup, and that would, boy, would that be fun with Carson Wentz. Or... Jimmy Garoppolo. Chris, we'll start with you. I am going to... I've got to trash Nick Foles. Like I, I know people are trying to make that connection and saying it's obvious because Frank Reich worked with Nick Foles 
and Carson Wentz in Philly, but I just I, I don't know that they can do that to Carson Wentz. One of the big things about you know the the new the move in trading him to the Colts was him being able to have a fresh start and him being able to flush everything bad that happened to him in Philly. And Nick Foles was a part of everything <laughs> bad to happen to Carson Wentz in Philly. They got a statue of Nick Foles out in front of the stadium. So it's just I I, I got to trash that. I will uh, I will cuddle the Philip Rivers deal just because I have to cuddle one of them, but I will marry Jimmy Garoppolo as an option if you hear the headlines about what's going on with that training camp battle with Trey Lance out in San Francisco. It feels like they're setting the stage for Trey Lance to be the week one guy, and if that's the case, then Jimmy all of a sudden becomes expendable. That could be a landing spot for him, but that would cost the Colts a lot in the way of draft capital, but I will marry Jimmy Garoppolo. There are so many aspects of this story that just seem strange to me. Like the fact that the the range is is like a month or three months. The fact that apparently he's had a loose, broken bone in his foot since high school. Nobody's checked that. You had a broken bone in your foot since high school and we're only dealing with it now. It seems very, very odd to me. Uh, I think I'm kind of I'm going to kind of match Chris here. Rivers to me does not seem like a realistic possibility at all. Agreed. I mean, he's not coming back at this point, but even with him not going to play another NFL game, part of the the relationship with with Carson Wentz would be forever altered if you ever decided to bring in Nick Foles. I mean, you would just lose him completely, and that relationship between Frank Reich and and, and Carson Wentz would be forever. I mean, so I don't think that that can possibly be the move. So I'll say that I will trash the Foles move. I will go with Rivers as the cuddle because something has to be cuddled. I probably would trash all three of them, to be quite honest, because I don't think Garoppolo uh, would be all that realistic. But if I had to marry anything, it would be Garoppolo. Yeah, I, in my, my closet is my, my Garoppolo jersey, and, and my fiance Ange was walking through yesterday, and she's like, she pulled it out. She said, wow, you must be excited to, to wear this soon. And I just said, something I should tell you. I, th- I think it's over. I think this is the end of the Garoppolo road. But moving on. But let big, me ask you a question, RJ. Are sure. you excited not to wear the Garoppolo jersey? It's time. It's time. Wow. Okay. It was a I, nice. It was a nice I, discount. It was a six toddler, so they got a good deal on it. And um, wow, Gordon getting very comfortable. Very. And one of those coat hangers, like the kids' clothes, with the like the little pinchers on the side. So wow. it looks nice on the hanger. You share an wow. outfield with a guy in a, in a charity softball game. You think you know someone? You think you know? Someone. <laughs> you really don't. Big day in NBA free agency yesterday. Let's run through a couple of the other moves. I want you to cuddle Mary or trash the, the following three uh, non-locals. Non-local okay. deals that were agreed to. Kyle Lowry and a big sign-in trade going to the Heat on a three-year $90 million deal. Uh, I, th- I think I know what this one might be. Chris Paul and the Suns agreeing to a four-year deal that could be, that's the, the operative phrase, could be worth up to $120 million. Uh. And Trey Young agreeing to a five-year rookie max extension with the Hawks. That could be, again, worth up to $207 million. There's a lot of escalators in there, incentives he would, would have to hit. But Kyle Lowry, three years, 90 mil to the Heat. CP3 and the Suns, four years, up to 120. And Trey Young, five-year extension with the Hawks, up to 207. Gordon, we can start with you this time. Uh, well, look, Trey Young, it could be a billion dollars. I have to marry it. I mean, that's the, the one that I feel like at least you're going to get some, some value out of that deal. The Chris Paul deal. I mean, you can't get too hung up on the money, but the four years at 37 years old, usually you pay someone for what they've done when they've won you a title. Uh, Chris Paul obviously did not do that. Another series, his team had a 2-0 lead and uh, flushed that right down the toilet. So I guess that would be uh, a cuddle move there. It's not as bad as the Kyle Lowry move. I don't, I'm not a real big fan of Kyle Lowry. And three years, what did you say, three years, 90, 90 million? million? Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, look, the, the Heat are always going for it. And this is a kind of a win now kind of move, but I don't like that move at all. Uh, so I will uh, trash the Kyle Lowry to the Heat. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay, we've got our first disagreement in CMT today. I'm going to marry Trey Young. I- I'm with you, Gordon. It could be a billion dollars. Trey Young <laughs> right. is 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 phenomenal. I mean, he's one of the best young players in the game. Probably going to be one of the faces of the league moving forward. Um, I am going to cuddle 
the Kyle Lowry move. I, I like the Miami Heat trading for him, being able to bring him over. He's got a relationship with Jimmy Butler. They're close friends. Kyle Lowry has the kind of toughness that Pat Riley teams are known for. I just feel like him being able to orchestrate everything with Goran Dragic and, and, and having Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo, I just feel like that team – is going to be one of those teams to watch again. Like they're kind of, they kind of took last year to reset, but I look for them to be one of those teams that could upset some folks once they get to the postseason. So I'll cuddle that Kyle Lowry move, and I will trash the Chris Paul move. I mean, for all the goodwill that Chris Paul built up throughout the playoffs, he blew that in the NBA Finals, Absolutely. having a two zero lead on the Milwaukee Bucks, and then just collapsing the way that he did. I, I just, you know, it, 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 there's no way. There's no way. That's going to be a terrible contract for the Phoenix Suns on the back end of it. It could be a terrible contract in year one. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, good. I, 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 I'm not sure whether or not we saw what we saw from the finals in Chris Paul was just him running out of gas or just a sign of things to come. And it's just going to continue to trend that way. So, yeah, I'll trash that deal all day long. All right. We are hearing a lot of love, a lot of love for Elijah Moore out of Jets camp. Here is Jets head coach Robert Sala on more so far. I was telling somebody this morning, he's kind of an old soul ahead of the game with regards to how he studies, takes care of his body, the way he approaches practice, uh, the way he approaches each rep. So he's he's impressive in the sense that I, we feel very confident that he's going to find ways to get better. This game is very important to him, and, uh, and he shows it with his actions every day. All right, so let me ask you this. Cuddle, marry, or trash? And Chris, we'll, we'll start with you. Who leads the Jets in receiving this year? Is it Elijah Moore? Corey Davis or Jameson Crowder? Uh, I am going to go with Elijah Moore. I mean, Elijah Moore is competing with Jameson Crowder for those reps in the slot to be the starting slot receiver. As Bruce Arians once told Larry Fitzgerald, the ball goes to the slot. Uh, I mean, that's going to be uh, you know, a young quarterback's best friend, being able to throw the ball in between the numbers. Those are typically the easier throws for young quarterbacks to make. So I would say Elijah Davis, Elijah Moore, I would marry, I would cuddle, I would cuddle Corey Davis, and I would trash Jamison Crowder just because it sounds like he's going to be the odd man out when it comes to that receiver group. Yeah, I would definitely, uh, I would definitely trash Crowder because even as good as he's been, he's dealt with some some health things, and I do think that he's going to lose some snaps along the way here. Um, I would probably go with Elijah Moore as the marry. Uh, that one's a little bit closer, but I think that the Jets are going to want to establish him. We've seen some rookie receivers come in right away and and, and make some some noise. And I, I do mm-hmm. think that they're you know part of the the excitement of this Jet season is kind of a fresh start and building that. Re- I don't think it was a coincidence that the Jets decided you know we're taking a quarterback in, in round one and we're taking Elijah Moore in round two. I know training camp, there's a lot of times where the excitement does kind of seem like it's off the charts, but for me, watching Elijah Moore, it does not take a lot of projection looking at his highlights at Ole Miss and being able to see an NFL player. I mean, that guy looks like an NFL player right now, and uh, I do expect him to have a big season this year, so I will uh, marry him, cuddle Davis, and trash crap. And I will say this, Gordon, to your point, Ole Miss receivers of late have a pretty good track record in terms of production in the NFL. Yeah. Just put that out there. Thanks for listening to the DiPietro, Canty, and Rothenberg podcast. I don't wake up at 4 a.m. to wear a swim shirt. Looking for more access to the show? Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at DCR on ESPN. And uh, we'll talk to Rob and Beacon. Rob, good morning. Good morning. How's it going, guys? Hey, Rob. Hello? What, what you got? Yeah, all right. Uh, we talking about the Yankees. Yeah, go ahead. In my house, we call them. In my house, we call them the Showtime Yankees. You have all these good name, big name players on your team. Great signing by Rizzo. Great signing Gallo. But the problem is that they don't play routine baseball. Putting the ball in play, doing the base running, situational baseball. You want to hit home runs to win games. But as a little leaguer growing up, the coach always tells you, don't try to hit a home run. Just contact the ball and get in and play. The Showtime Stankies do not do that, and it's a problem to their organization. 
good job, Cashman, for signing your guys, but you're not going to win games just by hitting home runs. You but, that's the pro- but, but, Rob, see, that, that's, uh, that's not true. I mean, up until this year, the Yankees did win games. Now, you, we can point out, you know, the, the, in, the, uh, in the postseason, it did not work out. But up until this year, they did hit home runs, and they did win games in the regular season based on hitting those home runs. They're not hitting home runs now. That's the issue. It's not that they keep trying to hit home runs. It's that they don't hit any home runs. Uh, up until this year, though, and, and one of the main culprits of that like everybody points out, well, they don't put the ball in play. One of the main culprits of that has been DJ LeMahieu, and he is, if you were going to pick out a guy who puts the ball in play on the Yankees, he's that guy. Last night, 0 for 5, Chris, as you pointed out. 0 mm. for 4 with runners in scoring position. He had multiple chances and has had multiple chances this year to kind of lift the Yankees out of the funk that they have been in, and he has not come through either. So... Uh, I think it's it's a real cop out to just say, well, you know, the Yankees just try to hit home runs, and that's why they're not scoring runs. That was their approach in previous years, and it worked just fine back then, and it's not working now, and I'm not exactly sure why. Well, they haven't been able to come up with the time to hit, Gordon. Like, I mean, no. we keep saying this; they just haven't been able to to drive guys. But they don't in come up with any get... hits. I mean, well, that... <laughs> it's, it's timely, untimely. They just don't have a lot of. I mean, they had three hits last night. I mean, they just don't score runs as consistently as they have in the past. No, they don't. But I, I think there is something to be said for what that last caller was bringing up, which is being able to continue to put pressure on the defense. Like, we, we talk about DJ LeMahieu, which is the quintessential put-the-ball-in-play kind of guy, but, I mean, he really is the only guy that's like that in the Yankees lineup. Like, they don't have a lot of guys like that. There's a lot of swing-and-miss guys for the Yankees in their lineup. Up and down the order, there's a lot of strikeouts. Now, the balance of that is those guys typically hit a lot of home runs, extra base hits. You're not getting those this year. So, I mean, I think there is something to be said for having more guys that can continue to put the ball in play and put pressure on the defense. Um, But there's also something to be said for guys, you know, being able to take advantage of some of the mistakes that opposing pitchers make and hit the ball over the fence. They're not doing either one of those. And as a result, you have a wildly inconsistent offense and you're not winning as many games as this team was projected to coming into the season. Speaking of uh, not doing either of those, like there's a there's a branch of the analytics crowd. There's the you know, the eye test crowd, either one of those crowds. The one thing that they have to have in common is that Brett Gardner is just not getting it done and why the Yankees Mm. consist. Look, he's not the number one issue with the team, but there is no number that you can show this year that would back up the Yankees' insistence on playing him as much as he's playing. Uh, the anal- I mean, in terms of hitting the ball hard, the analytics, you know, barrels and, 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 and on, on exit velo, he's not doing any of those things, and he's not really doing any of the other things either. I mean, he's hitting 199 on the season. His on-base is 319. Oh. Now, again, they're, they're hurt in center field because of the Hicks injury, and they're being forced to play him. But why they are so insistent on allowing Gardner to get mo- almost all of the starts in center field with the lack of production that he's had uh, is kind of mind-boggling, too, because there's no, there's no number or stat that would say he's the answer for sure. And it seems like the Yankees are insistent on him being the answer in center field. I agree with you, Gordon, but I guess you have to look at the alternative, and maybe that's something that the Yankees just aren't comfortable with. I mean, putting Aaron Judge in center field, having him be your everyday center fielder, is that is that the direction that you really want to go in? Like having Gallo left field, Judge in center field, and then putting Stanton in right field? Is that is that what you want your outfield to look like? Oh, Do you can trust we mix Greg Allen to... in a little bit? I mean, can we give the guy a little bit of a chance, some fresh legs, because... I mean, I, listen, I, I like him too, Gordon, but I, yeah. I, I don't, I don't I'm not understand saying every why. day, but can it be a little bit more of, a, of an even split at this point? At center field is going to be a black hole for the Yankees this year regardless because the, yeah. there's just no production there. But mm-hmm. Bre- Brett Gardner was not brought back to be an everyday player. It's almost unfair to him to be throwing him out there every single day and expecting something. Now, he did have one of the three hits last night, but I mean, mm-hmm. the, the overall numbers this year tell the story. He has not been a productive player. And we bring up expecting the Yankees to just snap out of it. Expecting Brett Gardner to snap out of it at this point is a little bit of an unfair expectation or, or, or for, for, for him, for the team. No, you're right. They're asking Brett Gardner to do way too much. But, I mean, that's that's the risk you run when you decide you're going to lock into an injury-prone player in yeah. Aaron Hicks at center field. Like, I mean, that's the genesis of the of the problems that you're dealing with in your outfield. 
And so, yeah, you, you thought that Aaron Hicks would be there. You thought that Clint Frazier would be your everyday left fielder. That hadn't panned out, so you had to make the move for Gallo. You bought him in. He made a nice play by, last night, by the way. Um, you know, yes. try to Try to keep that, that sixth yep. inning from mm-hmm. even, even being uglier than it was. But, uh, I, I mean, it's just – it's it's one of those situations, man. I, I – I, I don't think that there are a lot of good options for Aaron Boone in terms of what he's going to do and how he's going to deploy his players in the outfield. And because of that, I, I can understand why they're they're putting Brett Gardner out there, you know, feels like every single day. But, I mean, I, I, it's clear that they don't want Judge to be in center field, you know, you know for long stretches of time just because they're worried about the health situation with him. And, you know, Allen might not be a guy that they necessarily trust – to play in that spot routinely. So, I mean, I, I I get it. I understand what you're saying about Brett Gardner, but you also have to think about the, the potential options for center field and for the rest of your outfield, and maybe that's just something that Aaron Boone and the Yankees front office isn't comfortable with. Now, when are your co-hosts back? Are they back tomorrow? They're not coming back middle of the week, right? I, th- I think one of the R&R boys is back tomorrow. I think Dave Rothenberg is back for Were the rest men of the there? Week. Yeah, okay. I think we're gonna we're gonna so put them in there. Yeah, Monday is when all the crew is back together. I don't know. That's okay. a great question. I mean, it is, that's, if that's, you that's don't that's know, then, 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 that's I don't know. That's who a great question. Is. Let's pretend that Rick is finally done with his vacation on Monday. Let's pretend that Dave is not taking a fresh vacation on Monday. You're obviously going to be here by Monday. Where are the Mets in relation to the other teams in the National League East? Are they still in first place? Is the lead down to one? Because the concerns there have to be growing, considering the struggles. Would they you had go to therapy with night. me? I'm gonna say they're still in first place, but but Gordon, that has less to do with the Mets and more. To oh do no, with, absolutely. With, with the teams in the division, I mean, how can you really trust the Phillies or the Braves? You, you just can't. I, I, I mean, I just I, I look at that game last night. And it's like how could the how could the Mets? lose to the Marlins. I mean, just all the opportunities that they had creating traffic on the bases. It's not like they weren't getting hits, but they weren't being able to drive guys in once they, you know, once they got runners in scoring position. They were one for ten. So it's just one of those one of those things, man. You, you, you're waiting for that offense to click. Uh, at, you know, we were waiting in the first half for all of these guys to get back healthy. Now that they are back healthy, you know, you're, you're, you're expecting them to produce – and the fact is that they haven't been producing like we all expected them to produce coming into the year. So, I mean, we'll, we'll have to, we'll have to, you know, I, I guess we have to wait and kind of see what, what it ends up being. But losing to the Marlins, that's 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 an ugly loss, especially when you're a team that's in control of the division. Like this is an opportunity for you to put distance between the second and third place teams, and you let one get away from you yesterday. You just yeah. did. And Tyler McGill goes out there and gives up the four spot in the first inning. He's been better than anyone could have ever expected. Yeah. And it just kind of shows you the, the swing and miss that the Mets had at the trade deadline by not adding another pitcher, either a starter or a reliever. Castro goes on the COVID list, so now they're going to be even shorthanded in the, uh, in the bullpen. So uh, some, some anxious moments. I mean, again... You almost go back and keep looking at the division and saying, all right, well, let me run through the possibilities of someone coming and catching the Mets because they are leaving it out there. They're leaving the possibility of someone coming and catching them. It doesn't seem like there's a real good candidate to be able to do that. No, the it does Braves. <laughs> But uh, they they certainly are leaving open. They have left the door wide open as much as they can. Uh, Conforto bench for the second time last night in three games. Any issues with that benching? No, I don't have any issues with the benching just because he's not producing. Now, it's yeah. not exactly the season that he would hope for in a contract year. But, I mean, listen, you got to find guys that, that are going to give you production. I mean, that's that's really what it comes down to. And there are other guys that are coming off the bench that have been able to produce. Brandon Drury comes up with another big hit yesterday. Like, it's just there are other guys that are producing. And so you have to kind of look at it and say – you understand it. Like they're they're searching for guys to be able to help them manufacture runs because the Mets are the worst team in baseball or second to last team in baseball in terms of run scored. So uh, I can understand why they would pull Michael Conforto from the lineup just because you need somebody that's going to be able to produce in that spot. I get it. Yeah, and and he's one of the guys that you're you're looking at finally breaking out, and it's not even that he's breaking out; he's actually getting worse. I mean, the slump. He did have a hit last night. Came in as a defensive replacement, 
but uh, still certainly uh, struggled there. All right, lots of negativity this morning between the, the Yankees and the Mets. Let's, uh, let's turn the page to a little football here, Chris. Um, Mike Clay, who does such a fantastic job for ESPN.com, took a look at all 32 teams and ranked which teams got better the most, which teams regressed the most. And in his top five of teams that improved this offseason, one to five, he has the New York Jets at number two. Yeah, I, and, I, and I like it, Gordon. I mean, when you look at what the Jets did this offseason, they addressed edge rusher, wide receiver, offensive line, and quarterback. I mean, that's four of the top five premium positions. The, the biggest area of concern that you have for the Jets coming into this year has to be that secondary and namely the cornerback spot. Because, I mean, you, you don't have a lot of, of proven talent at that spot. I mean, when, when Bless Austin is, is, is the guy that's supposed to lead the cornerbacks group, you have to be a little bit concerned about what that, that's going to look like this year. But, I mean, as far as the defensive line is concerned and the offensive line is concerned, I think the overhauls that Joe Douglas did is a great start in terms of being able to shape the identity for a team that's trying to break in a young quarterback. Like, you want to be strong in the trenches and bringing over Carl Lawson, who was top five in pressures last year, being able to shine Sheldon Rankins. I I mean, being able to have Quentin Williams, who is a star, an emerging star in the interior of the defensive front. Like, I just feel like that's that's a good place to be. And then on the offensive side, I mean, you you got Makai Becton in last year's draft. And now you're going to give him a running mate over there at left guard with Elijah Vera Tucker, a guy you moved up it to get in the first round. And then, of course, being able to have that sneaky good signing of, of Morgan Moses from the Washington football team. I, like, like Those are moves that are going to kind of lay the groundwork for your young quarterback to be protected. So I like what they're doing in terms of how they're trying to shape this team. Now, I still don't have high expectations for the Jets in terms of win total, no. But I think they're they're on the right track in terms of being able to build the infrastructure for your young quarterback to develop properly and that's got to be priority number 1 for Rob Sala and Joe Douglas. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know how the moves will actually turn out, but the actual focus of the moves are the right ones, right? Like they're yes. focusing on the right areas, quarterback, left tackle, pass rusher, Shut down corners are work in progress, but there's only so many things. You, I mean, they had so many holes last year. There was only so many different things that they could uh, possibly fix in one off season. The Jets are not. They're not a quick fix, right? They're not. They're not uh, a fixer upper in that. Uh, in 30 minutes, the house is going to go from looking like a shack to looking like a mansion. It's going to take. Uh, a little longer than that for the the turnaround to happen. But I do like some of the areas that they focused on. Whether or not the moves pay off. Well, that will depend on the players. They, But at least in terms of the focus, offensive line, quarterback, I do like that. Here's Sheldon Rankins talking about playing on this defensive line and how he expects this D-line to play this year. I expect it to be damn good. You know, and I played, you know, I played with Cam Jordan. I played with David Onyemata. I played with, you know, Marcus Davenport, Trey Henderson, who just got paid. Like, I played with some dudes. But, you know, the, the dudes I'm playing with now and in this scheme, like, I feel like sky's the limit. I feel like... Whoever we roll out there, we're coming. And when that group gets tired, the next group's coming. And uh, and we expect to do that for 60 minutes of a full football game, week in, week out, and, and, and dominate games. Do you I mean, buy I mean, it? I mean, Gordon, I, I don't know about dominate games, but, I mean, that, that front seven should be pretty good. I mean, they should be a solid group. I mean, you start looking at – the list of guys that they had, we just went through the defensive line. I mean, look at the second level. I mean, you've got Blake Cashman, C.J. Mosley coming back from opting out, and then they signed Jared Davis on a one-year deal this offseason as well. So, I mean, it, that should be a really solid front seven. That's going to give them a chance to compete on that side of the ball. Now, we'll, we'll see if the secondary can hold up, but, I mean, you know, the front seven – it should be a, it should be a solid group. Like they should win a lot of those first and second down battles. So um, we'll we'll see how that you know their sub packages emerge and how the cornerback depth shapes up throughout the preseason and early on in the regular season. But you know at, at least that defensive line and that defensive front will give you a chance. Zach Wilson turns twenty two today on the same day that Tom Brady turns forty four. 
<laughs> Isn't that crazy? Same birthday? You, That's strange. That is that is strange. Now only if Zach Wilson could have a Brady yeah, well. type of career. <laughs> but see, that's what I like. Like when they got, I mean, one of the differences between the the approach with Wilson and the approach with Darnold was it almost felt like when the Jets got Darnold, the, it was like, well, we got our quarterback. The hard work is done. Where the hard work really should have just been beginning, and obviously they didn't focus on the right things there. Here with Zach Wilson. We'll see what we get. It's going to be, I think the expectation is it's going to be, there's going to be highs. There's going to be very, very high moments. There's going to be some low moments because he's coming in 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 a tough situation with a team that's kind of building on the fly. But I do kind of like that, that approach of they're not just feeling like, hey, we got our quarterback at number two. That's the most important thing. And, and now it's upward and onward. There, there's still a focus on we have to surround him and not make the same mistakes that they, they made, the previous regime made with the, the previous quarterback. Well, I mean, to me, the biggest mistake with Sam Darnold was saddling him with a head coach that was on a hot seat. Yeah, well, that like was... it just it, that doesn't make sense. Like you're, no. you're going to draft a guy with a, a top five pick, and you're going to have your your head coach be on the hot seat. Like that interrupts the development of your young quarterback. All of a sudden, he's going from just trying to figure out what's going on his rookie year to learning a new system, a new philosophy in year two. You don't have the opportunity for him to have that progression and build on some of the same systems that he was learning in his first year. So to me, that that was all wrong. But it finally feels like everybody in this organization is in lockstep, the head coach, the general manager, and now you got your quarterback. It feels like they have the opportunity to kind of grow together. And so I think that lends itself to being able to get the kid to realize his full potential. Um, but, but, I mean, that's, that's what the 2021 season is for the Jets. It's about Rob Sala establishing himself and Zach Wilson being able to establish himself. Those are the biggest things. And so you, you hope that it's comparable to what we saw from the New York Giants in terms of the team being competitive. But uh, Jets fans have to temper their expectations in terms of – the overall record of this team because you look at your division and clearly you are the worst team in their division. I don't think there's any question about it. All right, let's go to the phones. Jack is in Morristown. He wants to talk a little Jets. Jack, good morning. Uh, good morning, guys. Thanks for taking my call. Hey, Chris, I'm going to always thank you for the Super Bowl. Um, uh, I agree with you guys on the Jets, but I have I, I have one disagreement. I've been a Jets mm. fan a long time, and – I believe the Jets with Bless On Austin and Marcus May. I think Bless On Austin is underrated. He um he sticks. He's a good cover guy. He's very athletic and I think I watched him a lot last year. And I think under Sala as opposed to Greg Williams, I think he'll he's gonna have a really, really good year. So that's the only thing I disagree with and I'll just hang up and um listen to you guys comment. Yeah, I mean, listen, there's a lot to like with Bless Austin's game. Don't get me wrong, but I mean, that, that's, that's your lead corner. I mean, I, I don't know that you can feel comfortable about your, your secondary when Bless Austin is your number one corner. Like, I, I, I just, I, I, in terms of the overall talent in that group, in that room, I think it leaves a lot to be desired. Now, the safety position, you have a little more depth. I mean, you have Marcus May, you have LaMarcus Joyner, and you got Ashton Davis. So I, I think you're, you're, you're solid there. But, I mean, in today's NFL, you have to have three, four cornerbacks that you trust, and I, and I don't think the Jets are there. So that, I guess that, that was the point I was making. I wasn't trying to knock Blessed Austin, but I'm just saying in terms of the depth at the cornerback position, you know, the, the Jets could, could, could use an, an, an influx of talent. Like, I, I think they do leave – that group does leave something to be desired. I don't, think there's, I don't think there's any wrong thing about saying that just because I think that's where they're at. They couldn't address everything in one offseason, and I think the cornerback spot was the one spot that they couldn't get to this year. They'll have to try to figure it out in future years. Yeah. I mean, again, it's not, it's not a quick fix. Anybody who was expecting, I don't think that yeah. anybody is with the Jets after the season that they had, but uh, it's not a quick fix and you weren't going to be able to fix everything in one off season. All right. It is time for three stars. Today's three stars of DCR. And as always, three stars of the day is brought to you by 7-Eleven. Number three. Number three is going to go to Simone Biles. Criticism all over the place. She comes back for her final uh, performance in gymnastics, wins the bronze medal. That gives her seven overall for her career, tied for the most in U.S. gymnastics history. Round of applause to Simone Biles. 
Number two. It's going to go to the Yankee Stadium cat, although not quite as good as the MetLife Stadium cat <laughs> from 2019. Giants, Cowboys, Monday Night Football. I have the Joe Desiccatore call. Pro- don't have quite enough time for it, but I did want to give a shout out to the MetLife Stadium cat. Number one. Oh, Gordon, you almost made it. You almost made it. 645. Almost. It is Cuddled Mary. Oh, boy. No, listen, Gordon, I appreciate everything you did for the last couple days. Waking up early. Getting a head start. It's not things. easy. It's not easy to fill in for the R&R boys, but you did an admirable job. We appreciate you, Dave Rothenberg, back tomorrow. And we and we just appreciate the effort. That's all it is. That's three stars of the day brought to you by 7-Eleven. At 7-Eleven, get a $1 any size iced coffee with seven rewards. 7-Eleven, take it to 11. I'm going to fill in for them for the, the remainder of this week. In my mind, I am already on vacation. Chris, <laughs> always a pleasure. Great to see you again. And uh, hopefully uh, we get to do this again soon. Absolutely. Appreciate you, G. For now, it's Rule 76. No excuses. Play like a champion. It's Damer. It's Canty. And everybody on 98.7 ESPN. Thanks for listening to the DiPietro, Canty, and Rothenberg podcast. I have nothing left. (laughs) Hear more of DiPietro, Canty, and Rothenberg live weekday mornings from 5 to 8 a.m. on 98.7 ESPN in New York. The ESPN app, the TuneIn app, or on your smart speaker. Hey, Alexa. Play ESPN New York 98.7.